Hello and welcome everyone uh, to our webinar uh, Embedding Encounters with Employers in Curriculum Learning. Uh, my name is Agnes Harper, I'm a project facilitator at the Southern Universities Network and uh, our presenter today is going to be uh, Gerard Liston from Forum Talent Potential. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to do a really quick sound check. So if you're able to hear me, if you could type yes into the questions and comments box just to confirm that the audio is working, that would be great. I'm just going to wait half a minute or so. So if you can hear me, please type yes into the uh, questions and comments box. Brilliant. Quite a few answers coming through there, so the technology seems to be working. Um, now, before I hand over to our presenter today, um, I just wanted to give you uh, a bit of a background information uh, about the Southern Universities Network. So, we are a partnership of six universities and uh, we form part of the UniConnect programme, which is funded by the Office for Students. Uh, we were formerly known as uh, NCOP, the National Collaborative Outreach Programme, which is a, a term some of you might be familiar with. Um, our main aim is to reduce the gap in all forms of higher education participation between the most and least represented groups and uh, to support young people make value-informed decisions about their future education. Um, as for our webinar programme, it's, uh, it's part of the staff CPD um, offer and it's really just to help you um, be better able to support and advise students about their learning uh, and progression. Uh, a little bit about the format of the webinar today. Uh, we're definitely going to be uh, finished by 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded so you can uh, listen to it later on. Um, you're going to receive a link um, with the webinar um, in a couple of days time so you can listen to it again or you can also share it with others uh, other colleagues uh, during the presentation feel free to um, ask questions if you just type it into the questions and comments box uh, we are going to have uh, a q a questions at the end so you can ask them at the end as well if uh, if that suits you better um, and then finally we are going to finish with a very short evaluation poll uh, it's three questions we would really appreciate if you could stay um, right until the end for the evaluation polls. Uh, obviously, your feedback is, is really um, important to us to, to evaluate this webinar and also to help us with uh, organising uh, future webinars. So, um, at this point, I'm going to hand uh, over to um, Gerard. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just put the camera up for a minute. I won't give it up, but uh, just to uh, say hello and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak this afternoon to share some thoughts and experiences. And I think I'd add thank you particularly for coming along online uh, under the circumstances that we're all facing. Uh, it just is poignant, really, that you know, this was booked a long time ago using an online webinar. And this is something that I guess a lot of people are looking at as uh, potentially a fruitful way of not just teaching and learning, but um, uh, doing CPD as well. And that's what the purpose of this session really is. So um, I'll just maximize the um, slides uh, and I'll take my picture off. So um, what I want, to, as, as the title suggests, you know, I want to look at. Um, Meaningful encounters. Actually, I think the original invitation said embedding encounters with employers in the curriculum. And I think the word meaningful, it's really important because it's really easy to bring an employer along and stick them on, tag them on to some sort of um, curriculum input or a lesson. And that's not the same as embedding it. And it's not necessarily the same as being meaningful for the, the child, for the, for the young person. So I'm going to 
do a few things this afternoon in the 30, 40 minutes I'll, I'll, I'll talk. Uh, very, very briefly, I'm just going to reference Gatsby Ofsted, but I'm assuming my understanding is most people listening are careers leaders or have some involvement in uh, CEIAG and uh, therefore will be familiar with all that. Uh, I'll very briefly talk about the underlying CPD model that's been used for the case studies. And most of the time, I'm going to then devote to case studies and I will breeze through, there's about, I think there's 10 that I've picked. Um, so I've chosen them to make specific points, but I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm going to skip through them very, very quickly, just to give you a, a quick view of the kind of projects that it's possible to embed within the curriculum, different subject areas, different ages of, uh, of young people. And I'm going to, in the middle of that, or towards the end of that, just talk a little bit about impact assessment, which frankly is the most important part of all this. How do we know whether it's made a difference or not to the child? And how does it contribute towards each child's informed choice about whether they go to university, whether they choose something else, whether they pursue a, a career in one particular field or another? And then the final question I want to try and address is a question about how young should you start? The statutory duty is from year eight, but actually I think most people would acknowledge younger would be better. So my question really is how young? Um, if you are involved in careers, then probably talking about embedding meaningful encounters with employers in the curriculum, that will sound like a combination of Gatsby Benchmark 4, which is uh, about embedding things in the curriculum, careers in the curriculum. Benchmark 5 is the meaningful encounter, so it's a combination of the two. But, um, and I'm sure some of you will recognise this dilemma, um, if you were to talk to a a curriculum deputy or somebody who's responsible for teaching and learning, maybe a subject teacher or a head or faculty, they might say, well, that, that sounds actually rather like begging some of my time, some of the precious timetable space that we've got to get through the curriculum content, the specification of the GCSE or the content that has to be covered in the national curriculum. So uh, sometimes there's some resistance to giving up that space and time to something that will be, in their minds, labelled as as careers. Um, I'm sure many of you will be aware that there's, there's research which points out that actually you can kind of have your cake and eat it. You can uh, do careers and you can contribute towards learning. And you know, this report, for example, talks about how if young people see the point of learning, they can see where it's going to take them, then they're more motivated to succeed in the classroom at all with the academic objectives of. Um, attainment and, and progression. It's not one or the other, it need not be. I think that this was a very important piece of research that was done which very helpfully showed uh, that it is possible to do both. But you know, if there's one picture I'd suggest you have in your mind when we're looking at these case studies, it is the child who's, who's metaphorically saying to a teacher, you know, what's the point of this topic? You know, why should I bother learning this stuff? You know, how is it going to help me in the future? This is boring. It's boring. That's the phrase that uh, we often hear. And I remember full well, I was a teacher and a school leader, and, uh, and, uh, and I, not necessarily in words, but sometimes in attitudes, you see youngsters effectively saying, I don't see the point of applying with myself to this topic or this this, uh, this lesson and, and this book by Ian Gilbert very helpfully talks about how you address some of these problems but actually why it's a perfectly reasonable question for a child to be asking you know we should be answering for them why it is worth learning this stuff in the classroom why it is worth studying this topic and in fact ultimately why it's worth working hard at school. Um, I know often they've announced that they're going to give us all a break from the inspections for the period, but um, you will be aware that the new framework that came out in the autumn um, did a number of things, I think very helpfully. Uh, one of which was, you talked about a rich curriculum, and although it doesn't use the word careers, it does talk about putting together a curriculum which is planned and sequenced and builds up this knowledge and skills in order to equip young people for the future. It doesn't just say, to get them to pass a GCSE. It says, for the future learning and employment, beyond school, in other words. And I think also importantly, 
uh, they've given this space specifically for personal development, uh, which ultimately does lead to a youngster who makes an informed choice about where they're heading in the future. And it's described in that way, uh, provided preparing learners for future success in their next steps, that means employment, uh, training, um, or higher education. Now that's what this is about, uh, helping every single child. It's the statutory duty we have to help every single child make an informed choice about where they're heading beyond school rather than drifting through the education system. Um, the underlying model, which is actually the basis of all the case studies we, we're going to look at, uh, started out actually as being a response to a report that came out from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills many years ago, which was really contrasting the, the di difference in mindset between the supply and demand in the labour market and the education system that's producing young people for the labour market and employers who are looking for particular skills and there were gaps in that and you know, their plans are, are a result of that. So each of these projects that we're going to look at, each of these case studies that we'll, we'll just glimpse at, is what we would term a meaningful learning experience as a result of which each child should be self-assessing what they learned as a result of that. And then if you accumulate multiple encounters with employers which are embedded in the curriculum, then obviously there's a cumulative effect of that assessment and there's a chance for a youngster to reflect on how they are developing as an individual. So that ultimately, if there's the Shangri-La for anyone who's involved in careers, you've got a young person who's got this really distinctive CV, which really sells them as a unique individual with distinctive skills and attributes, and they are making an informed choice based on an understanding of the real opportunities that exist in the world beyond school. So that, that's the model we're going to look at. And but you'll see when I talk at the, about case studies, I'll refer to these six steps. Sounds like some kind of you know, mantra. It's not. It's really just a way of saying, let's be systematic about the way we go about this. Um, creating meaningful encounters embedded in the curriculum is not about just ringing up an employer and saying, can you come in? And be a surrogate teacher for an afternoon or can you come in and do something can can you spend you know half a day preparing something and then delivering it when you're not a, a trained teacher that, that that's not partnership and in order to get to that point where there's a genuine partnership there's some foundation work that needs to be done at top of the list is ensuring that there's commitment from the top and that this isn't just going to be a flash in the pan that the school or group of schools is really committed to this, see the point, the value of doing this. And then step two, which is probably the most important bit, is something that comes from the coalface of teaching and learning, the teacher's brief, which says, I've got a topic or a subject which I want to be brought to life, and this is what, what it is, and this is why I want it to be brought to life, and this is what success would look like. And then step three is just responding to that brief in a creative way using the principles of project-based learning and turning that into something which looks more like a challenge, a purposeful challenge for the young people. So it doesn't feel like an academic task or an exercise. It feels like something that's it's not lessons. It's not a normal lesson. It's, it, it has the kids on the edge of their seats. And only at that point would you approach an employer with a clearly thought through proposition, hopefully a compelling one and a mutually beneficial one as well. And I've touched on the importance of assessment uh, and, and uh, doing that uh, in a rigorous way. And then finally, I think this is sometimes forgotten, we, we very often sort of tick things off as being a task or an activity that's completed, move on to the next one, get through the program. And yet, there's, if we're missing the opportunity to showcase the success of the project and share the good practice that might have been developed in order to help others do the same, then we're missing an opportunity. So step six is about ensuring we capture that and we don't miss it. And I'll say a bit more about impact assessment later on, but there's three things that we really focus on. Uh, one is personal motivation. Did it engage the youngsters more? Were they on the edge of their seats? Then we look at future aspirations. So did we do something which helped them get a, a view about, a better view about where they might be in the future in life beyond school and uh, obviously that might change as they go through school but uh, but has it given them a further glimpse beyond what they already knew 
And employability skills um, is the, the final area of assessment. And there are different frameworks that can be used. And in fact, I'll, I'll look at a couple of these. Okay, let's, let's look at some case studies. Um, this first one actually is from the Northeast. In fact, it was part of the Gatsby National Benchmarks pilot a few years back. And many of you will be aware of that important work that was done. And this program was part of that. And this was a project from Kenton School, one of the biggest schools in the Northeast. I think it's one of the biggest in the country, actually. And year eight students there doing maths have to learn. This is the teacher's brief, the step two brief, which said, I've got to teach these kids statistics. And she actually cut out part of her um, scheme of work, which said, Look, this is what I have to get through. Here are the topics we have to cover. And she was acknowledging that it was a bit of a, a dry topic. She also acknowledged that the group she wanted to work with were quite challenging and tended to say, I don't see the point. And when it came to subjects like statistics, they really did say it. And so the employer that was involved is a local firm, a relatively small, fast-growing, high-tech firm. And, um, and the challenge was to use exactly those skills that were being taught about statistics and data representation, graphs and charts, uh, in a way that would apparently help the chief executive of this firm. And she was saying, this is the, one of the slides from the classroom resources, I'd be interested to see how you present the data. And she provided anonymized real data from clinical trials. That's what they do. It's data to do with clinical trials, medical trials. And, um, and, they, and so they had some real information to work with. And critically, what she said was, I look forward to seeing what you do. I'm going to be coming into the classroom, which she did. So when, they, when she came in, she saw the kind of work that would normally have been produced by this. Would, this is what they would normally have done. The difference was they knew it was going to be seen by Emma from day to child. She had to come in to spend, I think it was no more than an hour in the school to give feedback to the class. And these are comments. Um, I mean, the, actually, there was a video that the link I'll give you at the end will um, provide you access to the video. But the uh, happened to be the head of Key Stage 3 Maths, who was also the careers leader, was saying these kind of things at the end about, you know, we have we would do this stuff anyway. We'd all, we'd always cover this. Uh, so it, there's nothing changed. It's an existing timetabled lesson. I think it's really important for busy, pressured teachers. This is not something that we're trying to squeeze in in the name of career. So, so it's something that they were already going to cover and it's been brought to life by the involvement of an employer. And uh, maybe because she was a careers lady, what she recognised was that this particular project, and there were two others, in fact, at the school that were implemented in different subject areas, created showcase examples which could be shared with staff to say, look, this is what can be done. Could we do this somewhere else? Are there other topics, other subject areas that could be brought to life? And of course, there always are. There's all, every teacher knows when they look at their schemes of work that there's something that could be brought to life. Okay, we're going to Greater Manchester now. This is a couple of projects, different schools, older high school, um, Key Stage 3, Year 9 Geography. Uh, we're covering map reading skills, and actually, the, the brief talked about the, and, and the teacher, in fact, articulated how. Youngsters often saw map reading as being an old fashioned uh, skill. Why on earth do we need to learn this? I'm never going to have to read a map. And, and they didn't really get GIS, what that was about. That was quite a difficult concept. And uh, so the partner that was involved was Co op, one of the biggest employers in Manchester, in the city centre. Been there obviously many years. And most people know them for their high street stores. But, um, but the way that they choose the location of those stores, makes extensive use of uh, geographic information systems. And so they provided information, just the kind of data and charts and GIS printouts and so on that uh, well, they weren't using the software, but information that is just the kind of information they would be using to gauge where the right place, the most appropriate place would be to locate one of their new stores. And it's a big investment, so they need to get it right. And they also said, we look forward to seeing your proposals. And they weren't all, all the work wasn't sent to them, but they got a chance to see a selection. But of course, the students didn't know whether it was going to be their work or not. So they did come into the classroom. And I think it's important to say that, you know, if two people turned up from co-op in the classroom, they would just like, look like two blokes that turned up to the classroom. They're different really to a teacher. 
The difference was these youngsters knew because of the preparation that these were experts from in GIS, from uh, the co-op. And, uh, and they talked about not only feedback on the students' work, but they talked about their own uh, careers and, and the way they make effective and really extensive critical use of geographic information systems. These are comments from the youngsters who talked about it being an actual project, putting a shop somewhere, and they, it's more important than what they call normal work. I think it's a really nice way of putting it. And they talked about expert knowledge. You know, they've got great geography teachers in their school, but what they recognised was that these people that were coming in from the outside were experts in that particular topic. And I really love that final quote about feeling immersed in the situation because I was doing it step by step. It's what they do to pick a potential new site location. So they got the sense that this was purposeful. There was a real reason for doing this project. Uh, another school in Greater Manchester, this is ESA Academy. And these are two of the slides used by the business studies teacher covering the topic of sources of finance. Now, you know, they're, they're fairly... Um, you know, you can understand why they're being put together like that. They're not exactly engaging slides, but it's it's stuff the kids have to learn. It's it's in the specification, and it says what they have to learn. So the advantages and disadvantages of different sources of finance, you can understand why it has to be done that way. Hardly engaging, hardly purposeful. Uh, it was given purpose by involving this van hire company, which was literally, it was round the corner from the school. A uh, family business has been running for something like 25 years. So these are the two directors, they have other employees, and uh, so busy people. And because it's a small firm, you know, this is not some big corporate car hire firm. This is a very small but successful local business. Actually, the kids knew the, the business because the way they promote it is by driving a, 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 a Reliant Robin with their logo around, around, the, around the area. So the kids, oh, they all knew the business. They knew exactly where it was. They didn't know the person who ran it, of course. But uh, the challenge that was set, and this is one of the slides that was uh, used in the classroom, was from the firm talking about their plans. In fact, there were a couple of videos where the, the, the owner just gave them like a, a guided tour around the place and showed them the, the vans and talked about the business uh, in his office, out on site, uh, you know, just recorded on a mobile phone. And then he said, we're hoping to expand into long-term rentals. We need this bigger fleet what's the most appropriate source of finance to do that? What would you advise? And then it said that, again, there were a selection would be sent to Warren and Rebecca, the two directors, for their feedback. Now, this is feedback. And it's, you know, we sometimes assume that feedback has to involve inviting a guest into the classroom. Now, it just so happened, the time when we wanted that feedback, and the students who produced their work, was a time when they had two or three members of staff off ill. So there was, there was no way they could take time out of the business, even for you know an hour or so to come around to the school, which was a short distance away. But what they did was look at the work in the office and send an email with these responses. And I think very helpfully, what it did was name the students, actually said, I'd looked at your work, um, and Karima and Aisha, you know, and Good presentation, like the background research, like looking into expanding our range of vehicles. And now you can imagine the teacher said this. When they heard their names mentioned like that, it really made them sit up and feel that their work had been valued by this expert in business studies, a person who's running a business, a well-established business just around the corner from the school. So feedback can look as simple as an email from an employer. This is a project in, um, in Derbyshire, uh, Highfield School, uh, they were studying PSHG, and I picked it because although they wanted to do something which uh, they talked about wanting to involve a, uh, an employer in the community, uh, a bit of enterprise, and, um, and in particular to reinforce their employability skills. They had this commitment to a set of skills which they branded, they've got posters all around the school. In fact, on the, the right you see, a post that greets you when you walk into the school. So they, they were really committed to this. These, these five skills were everywhere that you went in the school. So um, it was important that the assessment related to that. And, and the organization that was involved to provide this, this task was a firm that you probably haven't heard of, MBIS, they're just a short drive down the road from the school. 
but you, you probably have seen what they do because they produce these um, signs that are typically seen on motorway uh, roadworks and they're solar powered uh, information screens which where the information can be changed uh, remotely and obviously can be put anywhere because they're solar powered so that, that's what they do and um, the challenge was presented and you know it sometimes can be as simple as this a copy of a memo read out in the classroom slightly contrived but it was the, the intent was genuine uh, from the uh, general manager writing to the MD saying we want to work with these year eight students at the school they already are committed to markets to providing these products for traffic management events management advertising and they want to expand into a new market. This was absolutely true, absolutely genuine. They were wanting to expand into providing information for construction site safety information. So have you got some bright ideas, the kind of messages that would work? And they were given the constraints of the number of pixels that, um, that can be used and the, and the technology that allows some animation, color and so on. And they came up with some ideas, again, which were that they knew were going to be seen by managers from NBIS came into the school and gave some feedback and actually gave some awards as well. And in fact, you can see they, this is local paper. They brought in one of the devices actually show, showing the winning, uh, the, the, um, the, the work that was chosen, the winning piece of work and getting some PR coverage for MBIS in the local paper, showing that they were committed to corporate social responsibility and community engagement, making them look good in the local community, quite rightly, is that they've done a good job. But that's what a benefit for an employer, a partnership can look like, something that's a win for the employer as well as a benefit for the school. And as you would expect in the impact assessment, it used the skills framework that the school was committed to. Okay, we look at... Um, uh, this is oh, this is a yeah this is a maths project uh, at Spice League Academy in just south of Nottingham uh, near Loughborough, and so they're covering what every child will have to learn about scale drawings, area, perimeter, volume, surface area, and the employer who routinely does this kind of thing, an engineering firm, they've recently won a contract for um, creating the, the the parking area at a railway station not not far away, and. Um, and the youngsters were challenged to work out how much um, ground had to be dug away, excavated and taken away, how much hardcore had to be brought in, the different types of asphalt had to be brought in, and how many trucks were required to do that. The minimum number of trucks that could be, because obviously that's disruptive in the local community on the street, and because they are a considerate constructor, we want to minimise, they wanted to minimise the number of, the amount of disturbance yeah, on the local streets. So the youngsters were learning about how a construction firm operates, what considerate constructors are about, and what a good construction firm, a civil engineering firm looks like. So they did produce their calculations and the employer came in. And this is a whole year group of youngsters involved, they were working in groups. But that employer, a relatively small civil engineering firm, had a chance to talk about their sector and promote a sector which is screaming out for skilled workers. Uh, to a whole year group of youngsters, and yet that was the first time they turned up at school. I'm going to just briefly talk about two science projects. This one is, they're both from the same school, uh, Tufton Hall School near Chesterfield. This one's year 10, uh, biology, youngsters are learning about hormones and I think it's homeostasis, I think that's the right word, but they were learning about um, insulin, that's one of the, the hormones, and uh, and it involved a local GP surgery. And a big issue is type 2 diabetes. It's a big issue nationally. It was particularly in that area uh, for various reasons, a particular health risk. And so the message was to the youngsters, can you help get the message across to people in the community that the things they can do to help themselves. And there was a short video clip of the uh, medical, uh, the nurse, practice nurse, talking about what they do, why it's important, how the youngsters can help. She was in the middle of, uh, you know, literally didn't disrupt her. She didn't have to come into the classroom. It showed her in her place of work. But she was saying, this is real. It's a real community issue. We'd be interested in your ideas. And their ideas were shown for real in the waiting room of the, um, 
of, of, of that practice. But of course, they would only be chosen if it was accurate and it was clear. That was the brief. So there were no way. There was no way that half-baked ideas or, or um, casual work was going to be used for real. So it was a real incentive for the youngsters, and they completed an online uh, survey at the end, which we encourage. And that impact assessment to be something that's quick and easy for the youngsters to do, and so it captured in, an indication of whether they were motivated about the, the project, whether they were motivated and had the on the edge of their seats. Uh, did it impact on their uh, the thinking about where they'll be in the future, their aspirations? And in this case, it was actually using a skills framework, an employability skills framework that had been devised by the local enterprise partnership, the D2N2 lab. So, you know, for local reasons, this framework was being used. And same school, also science, also year 10, same group of students were challenged to with a, a project involving tarmac. So this is a firm that manages the local uh, in Derbyshire, a huge quarry, a limestone quarry, and they make cement. Which and the project was all about chemical reaction. And you can imagine in the classroom that sometimes just looks like a, a load of formulae spread across a whiteboard. And in this case, the guy was saying this is the quality assurance manager at the site saying, you know, if, if what we do is all about uh, chemical reactions, converting limestone into cement is a chemical reaction. We want to minimize the environmental impact, particularly CO2 emissions and use of raw materials. So can you help us communicate that? And that, so that was the challenge that they were given. The feedback, and I think this was great, uh, the guy had his mobile phone, he was on site at a place that in a million years he would never have been able to take a group of youngsters. It was on top of the the uh, furnace, the, the mill, the oven, whatever it's called, that, where they make the cement. And uh, he, he not only named the students that he was giving feedback to and saying why their work was particularly interesting, but he gave them a bit of a cook's tour of the site as well, understanding what chemical reactions look like on site, in a job, at Tarmac. And they did the impact assessment again. And what I want to show you here though, and this is why, just pausing a minute to, to think about uh, the importance of um, of, of what's our step five, the impact on each child. And although those graphs I showed you a minute or two ago show the overall impact across the whole cohort of students, ultimately what's most important is for each child, what did they learn? So in this particular project, you can see that Jack was saying actually it helped him with his research ability. He's been told it was excellent. Alex was saying, I learned to cooperate as part of a team. Amy is saying she was proud of the PowerPoint skills that she developed. And Joel was saying, actually, getting through it and completing the work, in other words, it, it was challenging, it wasn't easy to do. And so it's the same challenge, same project they're all working on. And each child is saying, I got something different from it in terms of the thing I'm proud of and, and even the skills that they were developing. I think that's a really important point. It's very easy to assume that we want each child to get the same thing from a project. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, what you really want is a child, when they've done those multiple encounters with employees embedded in the curriculum over a period of time, to metaphorically have all these self-assessment sheets they could put out on the table in front of them and try to take stock of that. What, what's, what do they see emerging? What, what picture do they see of themselves? <clears throat> and actually, this is one of the documents that we provide in the uh, in the toolkit resources, which tries to help capture that. Uh, so it, it allows a child to see which skills they are strongest at, where they need to develop. And there are questions about uh, the things that they've learned in the process about themselves and their aspirations. And if you look at that, that actually is the, is that really is an embryonic CV. That's the starting point. Or something that could look like a compelling CV. And if you imagine that was that's something that could be done as an exercise at the end of each uh, academic year, you know, a child could progressively, as Ofsted requires, be developing their awareness about themselves and the opportunities that exist beyond school. So that's what we're trying to avoid. You know, an informed choice looks like the opposite of that, which is you know, not making it up. Uh, and it could be a CV, it could just as much be a personal statement on an UCAS application. So 
what I really want to do finally is to just ask the question, how early do you start? You know, and I've got to say, in the current crisis that we're facing, never has it been more true that we have no idea what the world will look like for youngsters who are starting their education in our schools. And you know, how do we prepare kids not just for jobs that haven't been invented, which is what's often said, but for a world we have no idea what it's going to look like. And one thing's for sure at the end of this crisis, it's going to look different to what it did a month ago. So somehow we have to equip them with the wherewithal to do that. So let me just show you three, briefly, just three uh, projects for I end. One is year six. This is, these are all schools in Derby, actually. Uh, village primary school where the youngsters were learning about identity. Uh, the partner that was involved from the NHS, not a doctor, not a nurse, but somebody from one of the allied health professions, a transfusion practitioner, talking about her work and training. She works in a laboratory with people in white coats, and she even showed the youngsters the blood bank, talking about the importance of identity and, and um, genetics in, in these different blood types. And then the youngsters did a scientific investigation, knowing that Amy, that was her name, was going to come into the classroom to see how, they, how well they'd done their scientific investigation. And the kid had to present to, to her. And so this is the kind of work they did, talking about the methodology, the prediction, the analysis. Uh, and then at the end, she gave some feedback, and she talked about her role, talking enthusiastically about working in the NHS, year six. And uh, I loved some of these comments, you know, the year six comments. We felt pressures, you know, they, they were under pressure. It, it, it was slightly stressful. Uh, proud of the fact she's a scientist, she's an actual scientist. So when they were showing their science, they were showing it to somebody who really understood this stuff. And then comment which indicated that this young, one youngster was even thinking how it's changed their consideration about uh, where they might be in the future and working in science. Year three. Uh, in this particular school, which is Pear Tree Primary in Derby also, uh, they use books um, as uh, an anchor for themes in, for each of the half terms. Uh, but this one, the book helps me escape from Pompeii, and as the teacher said in her brief, a step too brief. Difficult to plan a trip uh, or to see what that looks like. So they wanted something memorable. They're covering these sort of subject areas. So these are just um, extract from the material that's used in the classroom. So they were talking about an eruption of disease. Imagine being a painter. Well, this is the guy who did paint it. He's called Joseph Wright of Derby, a Derby painter. There's a whole gallery devoted to his work, which some of the youngsters might have been to, or they'd be encouraged to go to. And the curator talked about Joseph Wright of Derby, his amazing paintings of Vesuvius. And he talked about his role as a curator. And he said at the end, We'd like to display the best work in this Joseph Wright study centre. But alongside that, youngsters were also uh, separately uh, challenged to think about Naples, you know, in the shadow of Vesuvius and where pizzas were born. And, and lo and behold, of course, Pizza Express are the experts in that. And in the centre of Derby, there's a shopping centre, the Into shopping centre, where there's a Pizza Express. And the manager not only talked about his job on a short video clip here in the classroom, but he said, we look forward to seeing what ideas you've got for a Vesuvius pizza, which will make up for real. Great PR opportunity for them. And they would invite the, 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 the youngsters who came up with the best recipe to come down for a VIP visit. So two final slides. Um, this is a project that involved, in Derby as well, about transport. And uh, it was titled, Are We There Yet? And they were looking at different types of transport involved East Midlands Airport and who had adapted material that they had already been using in secondary schools, but they adapted it for primary school. And yes, these are comments from the teacher. They loved the airport role play area that was set up in the corner of the classroom, where not only those job cards, but also some role play scenarios were provided by East Midlands Airport. And Normally, we just look at transport here, and I love the language. It made their learning more meaningful. Bear in mind what I said, meaningful learning experiences. It made their learning more meaningful. It stuck more. It got, they got it more. It was real life for them. And I think in a nutshell, that's really what we're trying to do with these meaningful learning experiences, bringing curriculum learning to life and partnership with employers. That, 
project involve reception class, three reception classes in the school. So the answer to the question, how young, the answer is very young, as, as young as you like. So just briefly, uh, there are dozens of case studies, all the ones I've breezed through are freely available on the website, uh, along with many, many others. The stuff about the six step process and a load of other stuff, including some video clips are available uh, online too, and the link is on the website. There is the website address. And at that point, I'll bring up this um, camera, hopefully. So back on, hopefully we'll go back on screen. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got time for questions that you might have about, uh, well, I'm, I'm very conscious I've gone through a lot, but uh, then that, that may hopefully have prompted some questions that you've got. Brilliant, thank you very much, Gerard. That was very interesting, lots of really interesting examples. Um, if you've got any questions, if you could type them into the um, questions and comments box, please, and then uh, I'll pass them on to uh, Gerard for him to answer. Perhaps when you're doing that, um, I'll just mention that one of the things, you know, I've, this is a breeze through these uh, case studies, and I'm very conscious that although we if you print off the case studies or you find one online, there was PDFs which you can download. Uh, that gives you more information. But um, my experience here is that um, what typically happens is careers leaders will say, you know, I was speaking at, I was speaking at the CDI conference last year, and people say, oh, that's great. I love those case, oh, wonderful case studies. And what they want to know is, well, how do you do it? How do you gain the employer? What do you say? How do you find the employer? And, you know, like that majestic van hire. You know, I don't work in Manchester. I work with the school to find employers. That was literally going to Google Maps and finding which firms were around the corner from the school. So it's sometimes just a rocket science, but it's sometimes those very practical things that people ask. And I guess one of the things I'm interested in, you might want to just email if you want to uh, express your views about this, but I'd be, I'm thinking about the possibility of doing um, almost like behind the case study masterclass, unpacking in detail how a project uh, worked in practice. And if that's something of interest, then I, I'd like to hear from you. It'd be very interesting. So are there any questions? <laughs> Yeah, so one of the questions um, that is coming through is, uh, have you got any suggestions for getting employer support? Yes, um, I have. It really goes back to what I said earlier about that six-step process. That's not about you know, going through some mantra. It's about making sure when you approach an employer, you've got a proper story to tell. I mean, far too often, you know, I hear people saying, oh, I rang up an employer. They said, no, and you ask, well, what were you offering them? And, well, the offer, the, offer, the offer was to take six of our kids on work experience or, or asking them to come in and prepare a half hour session to talk to uh, year 10 students. You know, that, for most people, that's a huge commitment of time and it puts them like a fish out of water in, in an uncomfortable situation. So it's quite a bold employer that will say yes to something like that. Partnership looks like um, thinking about the respective role of employer and and the and the teachers so the teachers should remain responsible for the curriculum learning the obviously classroom management and, uh, and control and 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 the assessment all the things a teacher would expect to be looking after and and of course their focus is on the teaching and learning the attainment progression that that's their priority more than likely um the employer can add the magic dust that brings the thing to life. And so one of the things they want to hear is it's not going to take up a huge amount of my time or resources. And it seems very doable. And there's something in it for me as well. And um, and I wouldn't underestimate the sort of the, the, the sort of feel-good factor that if, if it's been a, an experience which was not onerous and it was invigorating, which typically it's great 
meeting youngsters in, in the classroom and it was a properly managed situation, then people say, yeah, sure, I'll come back. That was very doable. Why would I not repeat that? So I think the key is about making sure when you do that step four, you're presenting something which is compelling, it's doable, and it's mutually beneficial. It's not a huge ask, and that takes some preparation. I think the other thing which I touched on a minute ago is finding the employers, because um, obviously I'm sure many people who are online will have um, enterprise advisors linked to the school. There are networks out there who can provide you know, speakers, for example, for schools, all valuable. Uh, and they will have their own databases and, and will usher people into the school. In my experience, the best basis for a partnership is a local employer who's most likely to have an interest in a local school, the young people in that local school. They may well see those kids going past the, the place of work every day and therefore have an interest in doing something in their community, maybe even finding local people who might be interested in working for their organization or getting local PR coverage, like we saw an example just earlier. So uh, I think it's important to not just sort of rely on existing networks, other people's networks and databases, but actually think about who are the people in my area that would have a natural interest in working with my school. Thank my you. Uh, a question that is coming through that is actually related to what you've just been talking about um, is if you have any tips for a rural community where most of the employers are very small, so therefore they can be more difficult to engage. Yeah, I, I understand the question, and um, and you know it's assumed I think very often that oh, the employers that the, the ones that will be involved are big corporates, the organisation that have you know, corporate social responsibility objectives and budgets, and they, you know, I mentioned East Midlands Airport, they have a huge commitment to the community. They do all sorts of stuff. They've got a centre, an education centre set aside for working with local schools. So massive commitment. Of course, they're going to be involved in things like this. But actually, if you that step four, and, and, and critically, the bits beforehand are important in making it doable and I think actually the SME, the small to medium sized enterprise or the micro business is frankly is the untapped opportunity because clearly there are many many more SMEs and micro businesses than there are corporates and, uh, and, and if you get this right and present a partnership which is a it's not a big ask. I gave you that example of the, uh, the van hire company. It's a tiny business. It's two directors, a husband and wife, who have a few employees. This is not some corporate. It's not enterprise rent car. And, uh, and, and they were able to be involved. So even though their feedback was in email form, they still had an impact on, in that case, it was a whole, whole um, course of GCSE students who were studying business studies. So, uh, just because the organization's small doesn't mean uh, it, they can't be involved. In fact, I, the other example I was tempted to include it, but I, I, I think they used it at the CDI conference and I thought, well, I'll, I'll pick some different case studies. Um, involved a company, uh, the, the, well, the project was about uh, key stage three students learning about floating and sinking, the Archimedes principle and all that stuff to select. And uh, the, the employer that was involved was a company not far away, in Leicestershire, I think it was, uh, who was a, a boat builder, canal boats, they, they made canal boats. That business was a one-man business. And so his involvement was, you know, actually doing a sort of masterclass, you know, again, these things recorded on a mobile phone, anybody can do this, it's, you know, no technology or uh, massive skill required or, or cost. Uh, but creating that resort and showing how the boat was built and the place of work, there was just like a A to Z of hazards in the workplace, you know, from oxyacetylene to trip hazards. No way you could have taken the kids there, but they saw this guy in the place of work and they really loved the fact that his cat was wandering around as well while he was doing it. And he gave feedback about, about the students' work. That was a one-man business. So just because it's a rural community or a coastal community or whatever it is, you know, it doesn't mean, and, and there are corporates nearby, it doesn't mean that there won't be employees. There always are employers. And, um, you know, and it's just about um, getting that process right so you present something compelling and doable 
also thinking laterally about who might be involved in a project we did as part of that um, Gatsby Benchmarks pilot, uh, one of the actually a very good school, uh, uh, and uh, it, it was about um, I think it was PSHE, it was about money management, and the and the businesses that were involved were the shops from the parade of shops around the corner from the school. These kids knew every one of those shops, and every, from an optician to the local butchers. And, uh, and they were brilliant because it was all about money management. They were talking about how they do money management for their businesses. So small actually can be beautiful. And, and it also gets across the point that when you are looking at employment opportunities beyond school, it's much more likely that young people will end up working for a, an SME than for a big corporate because there are many more of them, many, many more of them. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for one last question before I uh, do the evaluation polls, and that's from Sarah. Um, are you finding that schools are linking these activities to a careers passport or a record of achievement style document for students? Very good question. Uh, I wish they were, is the, the answer. Uh, so to answer your question, I, in my experience, most are not. Uh, and it's interesting that that phrase was used as a blast in the past to hear about record of achievement or progress file as it sort of became. Uh, you know, and I'm sure everybody listening to this, if your background is in uh, careers guidance, you'll remember that those things came and went. They very often were just folders, physical folders that were stuffed with material which you know, they, the youngster knew nothing about. So, you know, they, they'd left clutching this thing, wondering what to do with it, and they stuck it in front of an employer. The employer would just say, don't don't ask me to read through that. Tell me about it. Tell me what your strengths are. Tell me why you're applying for this job. And that goes right back to what I said earlier about when I talked about not just self-assessment, but self-reflection. So I think the, I would say, you know, a modern version, maybe a digital version of a progress file and that could, of course, be embedded in things like Unifrog or um, um, the, uh, you know, there are various online tools that can be used. To, to gather that together in one place with it for the for the youngster. But what they've got to do is cons two things, I would say. One is consistency about the self-assessment. So always using the same framework, skills framework, and the same form even, so the same format. So you you can then compare like with like when the child does that self-reflection. Because if, they're, if they've done 10 activities, labeled careers in some way, and every one of those did a different type of self-assessment, which is often the case in my experience. How on earth can they compare one with the other? How on earth can they see whether they're progressing or not? And that's why coupling self-assessment with periodic self-reflection is absolutely vital if that youngster is being able to, as we would put it, self-express what their strengths are, what their interests are. And ultimately, that looks like a youngster in front of an employer saying, let me tell you why I'm applying for this particular job or a, a, an admissions tutor, why I'm applying for this particular course and why I'm the right person for it because I've got these skills, I've got these attributes. Here's an example of something I did in year 10. Here's something that I did really well or proves that I'm good at that particular skill in year 11. They've got a narrative and that's, when we talk about informed choice, it's really easy to use that phrase, you know, which comes off the statutory guidance, but it means a youngster who's confident about explaining, articulating what their informed choice is. Thank you very much, Gerard. I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. If you have uh, any more questions, um, if you use Gerard's email, um, I know that he will be more than happy to answer. Um, I'm just going to switch back to my screen and um, launch the um, evaluation polls. Um, could you, if you could please, uh, Answer them.
Thank you very much. I'm just about to uh, launch the second question. Thank you. And the final question coming up. Great. Thank you very much for your replies and thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you will receive um, an email with the link uh, in about two days time. So you're able to um, listen to it and uh, share it with colleagues. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye.